Um, so again, I really do want to thank everyone for coming. Um, I'm just going to ask that we hold questions until the end, and then we'll just really try to give a good period of time to be able to answer all of your questions, but just so that we can go through all the material. Um, so I'm just going to be talking about evidence-based medical treatments for autism spectrum disorders. And I really recognize it's so important. It really takes a village um, to work with our kids. I refer out a lot for OT, for speech, for ADA, for floor time, DIR, all of those things are so important, and the medical is an important piece of this as well. And this is with a lot of research that is now emerging, um, that we're finding, that's being recognized more and more in the medical community, that there is a medical component with autism and ADHD with a lot of these spectrum disorders, and so that when we can address the medical component, then a lot of our other therapies just become more effective. Um, so just a disclaimer, um, this information um, represents general research and clinical findings. Um, it should not be construed as specific medical advice for just your child. It doesn't replace the need for individualized care by your physician. Um, and then all the conditions and treatments don't necessarily apply to all, to every child um, or adult. And so just making sure that you have appropriate workup and diagnosis. Um, and discussing the treatment with your health care provider or, you know, health care provider familiar with autism uh, prior to initiating treatment. So um, just some of the background um, on me. My brother is uh, an adult um, with, As with Asperger's or high-functioning autism. Um, I originally did my bachelor's degree in speech pathology because I really wanted to be able to work with children on the spectrum. But just as I learned more about the medical aspect of this, that's when I decided to go into medicine. Um, <clears throat> So I'm a naturopathic physician, an acupuncturist, um, and was trained through um, the Autism Research Institute and Medical Academy of Pediatric Special Needs, uh, which is a board that is um, training physicians in the evidence-based practice of medical treatment for autism. Um, so most of you are familiar with the classic definition of autism spectrum disorders from the DSM-4. Uh, there's the three aspects, this, the impaired communication, impaired social interaction, and then the <coughs> odd stereotype behaviors. Um, with the DSM-5, the social and communication are combined, but you know the, the basic criteria uh, for those three areas is, is similar. Um, so we know that the, the incidence of autism spectrum disorders has really increased over the years. Um, and if we just look at this slide, I mean, this is looking at the incidence of autism compared to cerebral palsy, epilepsy, and mental retardation over the past two decades. Um, a lot of people say, well, it's, there definitely is increased awareness, but there was a statistical analysis done by a study, um, I believe it was out of US, um, UCSD, that um, compared, basically accounted for the increased awareness of autism, and with their statistical analysis, still found an increase in the incidence of autism, even when you count for increased awareness. Um, so basically, I'm just here to introduce that there is new research that, that's showing biological causes with autism. Um, so you know, we have a lot of these studies, immune dysregulation, inflammation. So I'm going to be going through each of these things. Um, you know, so these are just more studies that have come out. Um, so you know, it's with the idea that you know, medical conditions can actually contribute to the symptoms of autism, and that when we address those medical conditions that we can see improvement in behavior, in language, and a lot of different things. Um, sorry, uh, what I typically see is a gradual steady improvement with ups and downs. Occasionally I will see children where they have this really big dramatic improvement, but the more typical course is just kind of a slow steady improvement. Um, and then this is a really good link over here. Um, that it lists I mean, literally just hundreds and hundreds of research studies that have come out. Um, so when people ask is this evidence-based, this is a really good place to go to um, and to be able to look up. It's just the listing of those studies. Um, another thing is you can also go to Google Scholar and you can type in the references. And if there's any um, link to the full paper or to an abstract, it will take you there. So that's a good resource if you want to look up you know, some of these specific studies. Um, so with the idea that, you know, you have the symptoms of autism, which are what we see clinically, right? You know, the language and the behaviors. But it's with the idea that there are medical conditions that are underlying the symptoms. 
And so what we are really seeing, I mean, we can treat the symptoms, you know, if they have repetitive behaviors or self-injurious behavior with trying to correct that with ABA or with other types of therapies. But if you're not addressing the underlying cause, then it's, it's still treating the symptoms. Um, and not to say that, you know, all of, you know, other therapies just treat the symptoms, they certainly don't. But I am just pointing out that it's important to address medical issues, you know, if they are underlying. Um, and so the idea that if you have flies in a room, you know, you can get a fly swatter and you can kill the flies or you can get, you know, spray. But if they're, the reason the flies are there is because you have a bunch of garbage in the room, until you take out the garbage, the flies are still going to be there and you're going to be, fly, you know, swatting at the flies. But you really need to take out the garbage and then the flies will go with it, right? Um, so, you know, again, so, you know, this is our classic definition of autism. Um, but this is just to introduce a paradigm shift of autism as a biological disorder. So if we look at these different spheres, I'll be going through each of these with the neurological system, the digestive system, immune system, and metabolic system. So these are the main systems in autism that we find medical conditions. Um, so in the neurological system, um, we find brain inflammation neurotransmitter imbalance, so when we measure some of the different neurotransmitters, we find that some of them are abnormally low, some of them are abnormally high. Um, dysfunction of what's called the autonomic nervous system, so you can have an, a, what's called the sympathetic nervous system is dominant, so we hear about the fight and flight response, right, when you're being chased by the tiger, that that's our fight and flight response. The sympathetic nervous system is being activated. And there are certain neurotransmitters that our body produces when this, the fight and flight system is activated. Then you hear about the rest and digest, the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the calming part and allows us to sleep, to digest our food. And what we find in many children with autism is that there is an overactivity of the sympathetic nervous system, so that fight and flight. And so a lot of times they're always you know, very on edge. They might have hyperactivity. You know, a small thing can just set them off. And a lot of that, and we find that with certain neurotransmitters being elevated. Um, and so that is one of the contributing factors to that. Uh, seizures is also something that we see quite commonly on the spectrum. And not all of them have what we think of as grand mal seizures or, you know, someone falling on the floor and convulsing. But there are also absence seizures where a child might be staring off into space and then you're trying to get them back for several seconds, you know, and you can't get their attention. And that can be one manifestation of absence seizures. Um, so that's also something to consider um, in that. Um, so brain inflammation, uh, this is a study uh, by a researcher named Vargas, and he found, this is the brain tissue of children with autism. And what he found was that there are certain cells that are characteristic of inflammation. You know, we have inflammation in our body, our body produces certain cells, and they found an overabundance of those certain immune cells in the brain. And this is specifically with uh, the cerebellum. So it's just an, an example that there is a lot of inflammation in the brain in autism. And you know, so we ask, well, what's, what's causing that? There's a lot of different causes. One thing, we talk about oxidative stress. It's a big word, but you know, we probably heard about free radicals, right? That's the big buzzword in nutrition and health, that there are these free radicals that can cause damage in our body. And they always talk about eating antioxidants and food or things like that. And what happens is that oxidative stress is basically like these little bombs that are going and can explode and cause damage to our cells. Antioxidants decrease that damage. And so when we have mechanisms in our body to try to naturally decrease that oxidative damage, well, in a lot of children with autism and adults, those pathways are out of order. They're not balanced. And so we have more of what's called oxidative stress, these free radicals that are causing damage and inflammation in the brain. There's also what we are finding brain autoantibodies. So we hear about autoimmune diseases. So antibodies to actual brain tissue. Uh, one of the really common ones is called folate receptor antibodies. We always hear about how folate is really important for brain function, right? They always tell pregnant women to, to take folic acid. 
right? And because we know it's very important for the development of the brain. What's happening in children with autism is that there's an antibody that blocks folate from getting into the brain cell. And so when you have that, folate isn't able to get into the cell to do its job. And then we have problems with neurological development. Um, and there is, and this is actually a quite treatable condition. Um, you treat it with high dose folinic acid um, that's available as a prescription called leucoborin. Um, and there are also other types of antibodies, brain endothelial antibodies. These are these are antibodies to brain tissue um, in in the brain, and some of these are available. Um, they're not available through regular labs, but they're available through research labs or specialty labs. Uh, another one is the digestive system. Um, food allergies and sensitivities are very, very common. If you look at this paper by Tim Bowie, um, he is a Harvard gastroenterologist and he published a paper in pediatrics and he did a review of many, many studies looking at autism and digestive system. Um, and he found that it's estimated that about 50% of children, you know, looking at a summary of a lot of the studies, had about 50% of them had food allergies or sensitivities. Um, probably a lot of you have heard about gluten, which is the protein in wheat, and casein, which is the protein that's in dairy, and those are some very common food sensitivities or allergies that we see on the spectrum. Um, malabsorption, so not being able to absorb the nutrients in our food, what we call intestinal dysbiosis. So we know that there's important, it's important to have the good bacteria in our gut, right? They always talk about lactobacillus and yogurt, and then there's bad bacteria, right? If we get food poisoning, we have overgrowth of bad bacteria. When we get an infection, we have diarrhea. What can happen, and what is very common on the spectrum, is that there is an imbalance. That's what dysbiosis means. So that you can have bacterial or yeast or fungal or parasitic infections in the gut and not enough of the good bacteria to balance it out. Um, I see that very, very commonly. It's, it's rare that I see a child on the spectrum that doesn't have some kind of gastrointestinal issue. Um, gut inflammation, and then gastrointestinal distress caused by all of the above factors, um, which was found at about 60 to 70% of children on the spectrum. Um, so that's a good study that you can look, look at. So common symptoms, gastrointestinal, or GI is gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, in autism, constipation, if you have less, you, if you don't have a bowel movement every day, that is, that is constipation. We are supposed to have a bowel movement every day. Um, and it can also be hard or painful stools. Uh, diarrhea or loose stools, abdominal pain, food allergies, flatulence, or a lot of gas, bloating, and what's called GERD, or is commonly known as acid reflux. We see that oftentimes a lot. Um, so this is a picture of a child on the spectrum with diarrhea and fecal smearing. Some of you parents have probably dealt with that. Um, my brother had some of that when he was younger. Um, this is a picture of candida esophagitis. So our esophagus, basically esophagitis means that the, the esophagus is inflamed, and candida is a type of yeast. So this is a picture when they did a scope of a child with yeast overgrowth, that's the yellow portions that you see, with overgrowth of yeast in the esophagus causing inflammation of the esophagus. And then this is a lovely picture of a parasite. So I hope none of you just ate too recently. But um, So this is um, a quote from uh, the gastroenterologist um, at Harvard that he, in the paper in pediatrics. Um, he says, for a person with ASD who presents for treatment of a problem behavior, the care provider should consider the possibility that a gastrointestinal symptom, particularly pain, is a factor that increases the likelihood that serious problem behavior, for example, self-injury or aggression, may be exhibited. Sudden and unexplained behavioral change can be the hallmark of underlying pain or discomfort. Behavioral treatment may be initiated for the possible concurrent medical illness, or as the possible medical illness is being investigated, uh, diagnosed, and treated, but the behavioral treatment should not be a substitute for medical investigation. In other words, ADA and things are very important, but it's important to try to look at the underlying cause. And that's one thing that is, you know, it's, it's not common knowledge for a lot of our providers that if you have a child that's self-injurious or aggressive, that actually could be a hallmark of gastrointestinal pain 
you know, this is a quote from a Harvard gastroenterologist in pediatrics, which is a very well-reputed journal. Um, he also says, expert clinicians have observed that aggressive and self-injurious behavior may be the primary clinical manifestations of GERD, or acid reflux, in individuals with ASDs, but these symptoms are frequently attributed to non-medical causes. As a result, manifestations may go unrecognized as signs and symptoms of GERD, and importantly, may go untreated. Um, and so this is just a reference to that paper. Um, so this is uh, a case of a child who had self-injurious behavior, a lot of biting, um, hitting, <coughs> head banging, and they diagnosed, when they did a scope, they found that she had esophagitis or inflammation in her esophagus. Um, and then when it was treated, the self-injurious behavior resolved. Um, so you can see that her hand is clear. Um, she doesn't have all the marks on her face anymore. Um, also really common is pressure-seeking behavior to relieve GI pain. You know, when we have a stomach ache, we have food poisoning, what do we do? You know, we're doing this, right? Because that helps to relieve the pain and we feel better when we do that. And so our children, especially those who are nonverbal, can't always express, I hurt, you know? But if you see a child that's always trying to, you know, a lot of times they'll like press up against chairs or tables or they might go on the sofa or they might be doing this or always, kind of lie on the ground, pressing on their stomach, that can be a manifestation of gastrointestinal pain. So that's, you know, it doesn't mean that's always what that behavior is, but it's a, it's a clue to look for that and to investigate that. Um, probably many of you have heard about the gluten-free casein free diet. So it's a diet that's free of the protein in wheat, which is gluten, and then also dairy-free. Um, so these are just some studies um, that, that support that. Um, there are also some other diets. Um, these are not as well documented in the literature and the research, um, but these are some diets that are oftentimes anecdotally found to be helpful. Um, so also eliminating soy. Soy has some proteins that are similar to the proteins in dairy. So I find a lot of times when people go off of dairy, that one of the first things that they do to try to replace it is soy. But soy can also be a problem in many children. So um, I will oftentimes recommend they go off of soy as well. Um, allergy elimination, food allergies can be tested through stool, through blood tests, um, several different ways. Um, and so just identifying those allerg food allergens and, and eliminating those. Um, preservatives and dyes, um, there are many dyes that are um, documented in the literature to be connected to hyperactivity in children. Um, also preservatives, things like MSG. Most of those just aren't good for us to, for you know, even us to, to eat anyway. Um, specific carbohydrate gaps. Um, so these are, sorry, some other diets, low oxalate, candida. Um, again, these are not as well documented in, in the literature, but these are found anecdotally by many parents to be helpful. Um, immune system problems. So chronic infections, when you have yeast or fungal overgrowth, viral infections, um, bacterial infections. There's something called CANDIS, or CANS, which is Pediatric Autoimmune Disorder Associated with Strep, or Streptococcus. So you, there are some children that can have chronic strep infections, and that with CANDIS, what that's doing is that it's associated with obsessive compulsive behaviors. Um, and so it's a specific, there's a specific diagnostic criteria for that. Um, Allergies, so environmental allergies, you know, grass, wheat, you know, flowers, things like that. Food allergies, eczema, autoimmune conditions, and chronic inflammation. Um, so, you know, these are some pictures with, uh, with immune signs and symptoms. You, know, you might see eczema, rashes, um, the dark circles under the eyes are a really common hallmark. I mean, that can be related to insufficient sleep. It can also be related to food allergies or both, um, or just allergies in general. Um, and then this is just a picture of toenail fungus. Um, so the immune system, normally your immune system should be able to respond to that and to get rid of the infection. But if with many children on the spectrum, what we find is that the immune system actually is impaired. It's not functioning optimally. And so there are some children who will just get sick all the time. And that's a sign that the immune system is not functioning optimally. Um, and then that can be a contributing factor to some of the things that they're manifesting with. 
Um, these are just some research studies um, on immune function that you can you know, peruse or look through. Um, and this is just a portion of the studies. If you go to that link that I first pointed out with the, you know, in the, one of the first slides, it, you know, it says hundreds of research studies. I mean, there are many, many more. Um, and they're organized by topics. So it's a good one to, to look through. Um, metabolic system disturbances. Um, so we know that the liver is really important for our bodies to be able to detoxify things that we're exposed to from the environment and also our body, our own cells make waste products, right? So our liver has to filter the blood and break that down and excrete it and then it goes out into our digestive tract and we excrete it out through our, our poop. Um, so but the liver detox pathways, there's certain biochemical pathways. There's one that's called methylation. There's another one that's called sulfation. There's several others. Um, but some of these pathways we find commonly to have problems in autism. And so what can happen is there's more susceptibility to environmental toxins. So for most people, you know, there's air pollution, there's you know, things that we're exposed to in the environment. And for most of us, if our liver is functioning normal, we're able to break that down and excrete it's not a problem. For many of the children on the spectrum, I find that they have an elevated body burden of heavy metals and lead and mercury, things like that. And it's, I mean, you know, if they're in an old house maybe that has paint, they might be, they might be getting exposed. But for some of them, they can have problems with the liver actually being able to break that down and excrete it. And so if you have a problem with the filter, all of that stuff builds up in your body. And as we know, lead and mercury and other heavy metals are toxic to our neurological system. And then that can be a contributing factor. Um, there's also um, something that you might have heard about. It's called glutathione. It's an important antioxidant in our body that helps us to break down toxins. And many children on the spectrum have low levels of glutathione. Um, one uh, short clinical piece is that uh, Tylenol actually decreases our levels of glutathione. So I will oftentimes recommend that children on the spectrum, if you test them and they have low glutathione, that they not use Tylenol to try to reduce fevers. Um, I will usually try to recommend an alternative, like children's ibuprofen, something else. And there are also some other ways naturally to just help to manage fevers. And fevers, is, fevers are also a natural part of our body's immune function. Um, there are some studies showing that if we suppress a fever that's not dangerously high, that in some cases in children it can actually prolong the illness. Um, but just one you know, sure thing with that just as far as Tylenol. Um, mitochondrial disorders. Um, mitochondria are these little energy the organelles, these little things inside every one of our cells that make energy. And with many children on the spectrum, there are problems with the mitochondria. Symptoms of that, they can have low muscle tone, low energy. They might have been, when they were babies, what we call floppy babies, you know, really low muscle tone. They just like fluff over. They don't have any tone to their muscles. They could have constipation um, and a host of other issues. Um, so those are some things. Um, cholesterol metabolism. And many children on the spectrum actually have low levels of cholesterol. And that can be dangerous just as much as high cholesterol can be. Um, phenylketonuria. Um, high uric acid, so these are some other things less common. Um, high propionic acid, I'll go over that in a little bit. Um, but these are just some problems that we see with the metabolic system. Um, so these are some studies, um, just some references to some of these things. Um, I know this is kind of a scary diagram if you're not a biochemist, but don't worry. So, but basically, you know, when I talked about the liver detox pathways, there's one that's called methylation. This is the methylation pathway. And I know this looks scary, but basically it's a problem with some of the enzymes in the pathways. And what we can do is with specialized lab tests, we can measure some of these things, the SAMHSA and the GSH. And what it does is it gives us a measure of the pathway that we call methylation to see how well this pathway is working. Um, and so it talks about when this pathway, this liver detox pathway, isn't working well, then what you can have is oxidative stress. Those little things, right, I talked about that, like, you know, blow up your cells. Um, oxidative stress, the free radicals, leads to more inflammation. So, 
Um, some metabolic diseases are treatable, so with things like mitochondrial disorders. Mitochondria are the little things that I talked about in each of our cells. It helps us to make energy. Um, so you can use things like CoQ10, carnitine, B vitamins. There are a host of other things that we can do um, that can help to treat those conditions. And it really depends, too, on the extent of the disorder. Um, so that's why testing is important. Um, and I talked about um, phenylketonuria. So there's a substance called phenylalanine. Um, it's a, used in artificial sweeteners. And so there can be problems with some children being able to eliminate that from their body. Um, so they just have to avoid phenyl phenylalanine. Um, propionic acid. Uh, propionic acid is a product of a bacteria in our gut that's called Clostridia. And it's also a, a common food preservative. There was um, an interesting study, it's not a, a human study, but there was a study done on rats. And what they did was that they injected rats with propionic acid um, into the brain and found that the rats then seemed to display autistic-like behavior so that they spent more time apart, um, they didn't spend as much time interacting, and they had a lot of altered responses to interaction. So, you know, normally when two rats approach each other, they'll interact, but these rats would just, just walk by each other, very aloof, just not aware of the other rats. Um, and then when they looked at their brains, they found that there was inflammation in the brain. Um, and so this is just one model, um, <clears throat> and this is something that we find oftentimes in some children with autism that they can have high levels of propionic acid. Um, and then that can be something that could be a problem either with gut bacteria and overgrowth of clostridia um, in the gut, which is usually one of the more common issues. Um, so warning signs of metabolic disease and autism spectrum disorder, low muscle tone, easy fatigue, poor physical endurance. Um, when they get sick, they get really, really weak. They become like a limp rag doll. Um, or repeated regressions. They get better and then they regress, and they get better and then they regress. Um, and so when you have those signs, um, evaluation by a medical geneticist or meta metabol uh, metabolic specialist is indicated. Um, so a, medical, a basic medical approach to treating autism spectrum disorders, uh, we go through the medical history, physical exam, and lab testing to identify those medical conditions. Um, identify and minimize toxin exposure in the environment and in the diet, and then identify and eliminate food allergens, um, and really trying to get a nutritious diet. I know it's really hard for a lot of our kids. A lot of our kids are extremely picky eaters. I know some kids that will only eat three foods. Um, so, you know, so those are some of the challenges. Um, oftentimes, what I find is that if you eliminate gluten and casein from the diet, they have sensitivities to those things, then oftentimes their food choices will start to expand because they're literally kind of hooked on those foods. Um, and so that's something that can, that can help um, in some cases. Um, <clears throat> and so vitamin mineral supplements to address nutritional deficiencies and then treating the medical problems, you know, when you find them. So neurological system, digestive system, immune system, metabolic system. Um, so I'm going to go through some potential issues in autism and then some potential medical causes um, behind those. Um, so the sympathetic nervous system, you know, I mentioned the fight or flight, they can, that can be overactivated, right? So that can be one cause where a child has difficulty, especially if they have difficulty falling asleep. Uh, when you have acid reflux, that can manifest if a child especially has resistance to lying down, just in general, even if it's not nighttime, but during the day if they have resistance to lying down, taking a nap. Because sometimes if they have acid reflux, when they lie down, the acid can reflux up into the throat, especially if they're nonverbal and can't tell you that. Then the child can just have a lot of resistance to lying down, and that's, that's one flag to potentially screen and look for acid reflux. Uh, sleep apnea, where a child stops breathing, or you know, that can occur in adults oftentimes too, so that can be a contributing factor to difficulty with sleeping. That can be an issue with the tonsils being enlarged, um, and so they can block the airway. And a lot of times if a child has a lot of allergies or is getting sick a lot, then they can have enlarged tonsils, and then that can contribute to sleep apnea blocking the airway. 
and then causing problems with that. Um, they can also have gastrointestinal or neurological inflammation. Um, and then those can contribute to difficulty sleeping. Um, so some potential medical treatments, um, melatonin, there's a lot of studies on melatonin. Um, I typically start parents, you know, at half milligram or one milligram, going up to five milligrams a night. Um, and with melatonin, you want to try to keep the dosage as low as you need. Um, melatonin is not habit forming. It's an, it also has some antioxidant properties. Um, but one thing with melatonin is if you get the dosage uh, really high, like over 10 milligrams, there's a greater chance of melatonin spiking and then dropping. And so then you can have the child will go to sleep, but then they might wake up more frequently during the night. So that's why I, tr I try to encourage parents to try to keep the dosage as low as possible. I, I don't usually find that to be an issue until they're getting usually up to 10 milligrams or higher a night. Um, 5-HTP, that's 5-hydroxytryptophan, that's basically a precursor to melatonin. Melatonin is an important, um, well, it's basically the substance that our body secretes to make us sleepy at night, right? And that's especially when it gets dark, then our body will secrete melatonin. 5-HTP um, is a precursor, it makes melatonin in our body. Um, so that can sometimes be helpful. Um, there's something else called L-tryptophan that can oftentimes be helpful. That's the amino acid that's in turkey. Right? They always talk about you need to get sleepy after you eat on Thanksgiving, right? Um, that can be helpful for some children. Um, magnesium can also be helpful if they have overstimulation of that fight or flight response. Magnesium can be calming. Uh, Epsom salt baths can also be very helpful for some children. Epsom salts are magnesium sulfate salts. So the magnesium is absorbed through the skin and that can have a calming effect. That's another way to get magnesium in the children, especially if they have difficulty with taking supplements. Um, so two to three cups um, in bath, in like, you know, in a bathtub before bed, that can be a very helpful thing um, for difficulty with sleeping. Um, and then addressing the cause. So if they have reflux, you know, treating that, uh, causes of apnea, you know, sleep apnea. Um, you know, one thing with reflux I often find um, is helpful is using digestive enzymes. Um, I usually prefer not to use acid blocking drugs. Um, for acid, the stomach acid is very important for our body to digest the food. Um, and so if we block the stomach acid, especially in children, that might in the long run contribute to more of a difficulty with digesting their food. It depends on the child. For some children, acid blockers, if they are really overproducing acid, that can be helpful. But a lot of times I find that we can correct it just using digestive enzymes. Um, the digestive enzymes help to break down our food. And basically, if you have difficulty breaking down, digesting your food, that can be a cause for acid reflux. It's not, it's not always an overproduction of acid. That's what's talked about so much with the acid blockers, um, like omeprazole or an XCM. Um, and those can be helpful if you have an acute overproduction of acid, but that's, that's not always the case. It can be and it's just an issue of difficulty digesting the food, not being able to break it down, and that can cause, if you're not digesting your food well, that can cause reflux. So that's why digestive enzymes can be helpful in those, in those cases. Um, so like I said, apnea, um, trying to address that. There's different causes of apnea. Like I said, it could be obstructive, like um, enlarged tonsils. Um, you know, it can be biochemical, so you have to really look at that. Healing the gut. So if the gut is inflamed, then you really need to try to address that. Um, and some things that we can use uh, commonly probiotics, like good bacteria, um, digestive enzymes, using things. Um, there's something called a glutamine powder um, that can help to heal the gut, um, cabbage juice. I mean, sometimes it's like good luck getting that into a kid, but if you can mix it with other types of juices, um, cabbage juice is also something that's very helpful um, to heal the lining of the, of the gut. Um, these things that I'm mentioning that aren't on the slides, I mean, on the slides I really tried to keep it things that are, you know, that we have research studies. Some of the other things I'm mentioning aren't necessarily well substantiated in research studies or literature, but they're clinically things that I find uh, things that I find helpful. Um, decreasing inflammation. Um, so that depends if it's gastrointestinal inflammation. You know, doing some of the things that I mentioned help decrease inflammation, like 
probiotics or digestive enzymes, L-glutamine powder, um, cabbage juice, things like that. If it's brain inflammation, sometimes we'll have to do different things. Um, I find curcumin, uh, which is an extract from turmeric, very helpful in reducing inflammation, uh, so things like that. These are just some research studies on the effects of magnesium. Um, you know, specifically, you know, it talks about hyperexcitability in the central nervous system on that first study, so that can be very helpful. Uh, magnesium is oftentimes helpful in ADHD when you have a hyperactivity component because it can be an over-excitation of that fight-or-flight system. Um, and so those are just some studies that you can look at. There's a lot of research on melatonin. Melatonin is something that's, that's oftentimes very helpful. Um, also, uh, just a note on melatonin, just sleeping in a dark room um, can be helpful. Um, even a nightlight can sometimes be enough to interfere with the production of melatonin because their body will naturally make melatonin when it's dark. I know that can be an issue with some of the children, you know, some children it's totally dark and they have night terrors or they're screaming, you know, so, um, you know, but maybe just trying to reduce the, you know, try to dim the night light, things like that. Um, or maybe once they're asleep, you know, then turn it off. Um, because even when they're asleep, I mean, even when our eyes are closed, you know, if the light is on in the room, we can still sense that. Um, so maybe after they've fallen asleep, just turning off the night light, especially if they have difficulty with waking up frequently in the middle of the night, it can be a problem with melatonin production sometimes. So, um, and there's also you know research studies on 5-HTP, which is that precursor to melatonin that I talked about. Um, tantrums, you know, when we look at these tantrums, and if we look back at that study by Tim Bui, who is the Harvard gastroenterologist, um, talking about gastrointestinal inflammation that can be showing behaviors that can manifest. Um, tantrums. I mean, if you think about, you know, if you're in chronic pain, you know, if your tummy is upset, you don't feel good. And if someone comes and talks to you, you can be like, don't talk to me, you know, because, I mean, when we're in pain, we don't feel good, you know. And so especially a lot of our children that if they're nonverbal and they can't communicate to us what they're feeling, how they're feeling, you know, how to make it better, they get really frustrated. And so, you know, they're, you know, their level just gets you know, lowered, and so their threshold, you know, you can go over that a lot easier, and then that can lead to tantrums. Um, so that can be one of the things, um, or gastrointestinal uh, infection. Acid reflux can be another issue. A lot of these, you know, so a lot of these medical issues will contribute to a lot of the same types of problems that we see. Um, acid reflux can be something, um, brain inflammation or autoantibodies to the brain, so testing for those things, treating them, uh, food allergies, I find really commonly that when we, you know, decrease uh, exposure to gluten and to casein, the tantrums oftentimes will, will decrease or will improve. Um, nutrient deficiency, sometimes they can be deficient in certain nutrients. And so then, you know, the, the biochemical balance, their brain isn't being well nourished, their body isn't being well nourished, especially if they're picky eaters. You know, I had a kid that the only thing, I had one kid that all he ate was those little pork rind chips, you know, those, and I mean, his cholesterol was just mm -hmm. out of this world, but, um, but that's the only thing he would eat, you know, is the pork rind chips. Um, so that can be an issue, especially if we have kids who are picky eaters, and a lot of times as a parent, you get really desperate just to get food into your kid, right, so you'll give them whatever they'll eat. Um, the, the theory and the idea behind the gluten and casein is that they actually have a chemical structure that's similar to opiates and so you know so we have you know opiates like heroin or morphine and not seeing the same as that but if you have difficulty breaking those down then what they can do is they actually because of the similarity in the chemical structure they can actually bind to opiate receptors in the brain um, for most of us if you can break it down appropriately then it doesn't cause that type of effect but for some children on the spectrum for, for you know many that have sensitivity to gluten and casein um, if they can't break it down, it binds to opiate receptor, then it actually can be, have some effects like an opiate. And so you can have addictive behavior. And I have a lot of kids that parents are like, what, you want me to take away gluten and casein? That's the only thing that they'll eat. Like the only thing they will eat is mac and cheese, or the only thing they will eat is you know, grilled cheese sandwiches. Um, the only thing he'll drink is milk. 
you won't drink anything else, you know. And um, so it's really hard, and I've seen many children go through withdrawal behaviors when you're first taking those foods away. It is really, really hard because it's almost like a drug-seeking type of behavior because those are activating the opiate receptors and they, they really want that. And so when you try to take it away, it can be extremely difficult in the beginning. Um, but, you know, it's just persevering. Um, and it, when children are hungry enough, they will eat. Um, and so and once they can get the gluten and the opiate peptides or the parts of the amino acid out of their system, once they can do that, um, then a lot of times it will be easier and they will start accepting new foods because they won't only be wanting just that one food or just gluten and easier. Um, so, um, potential medical treatments. Um, so, you know, treating gastrointestinal infection or inflammation if that's present. Um, if they have acid reflux, treating that, you know, so I mentioned digestive enzymes. Also, if we remove food allergens, then also oftentimes acid reflux can improve without having to use things like acid blocking drugs. Um, decreasing neurological inflammation, uh, so I mentioned things like curcumin. There are other things, um, low dose naltrexone um, is another treatment. Um, it's an anti inflammatory that's using very, very low doses. Um, and children on the spectrum can be helpful in reducing inflammation. Um, eliminating food allergies, uh, looking at the gluten-free casein, gluten-free casein free diet, um, and then if you have nutrient deficiency, deficiencies, supplementing those. Um, common issues in autism, so you can have impaired language or speech. That's something we see really, really commonly among our kids. Um, so potential medical causes, again, a lot of the same things. So, you know, nutrient deficiencies. Um, food allergies, including gluten, casein, um, brain inflammation, autoantibodies, gastrointestinal inflammation, toxin exposure. You know, so I mentioned the issue with the liver pathways not being able to break down and excrete toxins. So when we're exposed to them, then that can accumulate in the body, right? Um, so that can be one of the things that can be contributing. Um, so, you know, some, these are just some articles. Um, this is, uh, some of you might have uh, come to the talk when uh, Dr. Richard Fry uh, spoke at TACA several months ago. Um, so he was one of the people who published his paper. You can see his name on there. Um, so this was specifically um, the, the one that I talked about, the folate receptor antibody. So folate, there's an antibody blocking folate from being able to get into the brain cell. So this is that study. Um, and then also this is uh, just looking at this is a, uh, a review study that looked at uh, many different studies and that they found um, that there is significant evidence for physiological abnormalities in autism spectrum disorders. So immune system dysfunction, like I mentioned, either the immune system not functioning well enough or uh, autoantibodies, autoimmune issues, uh, inflammation, oxidative stress, like the free radicals that I mentioned, mitochondrial dysfunction, mitochondria are the small little organelles and the cells that make energy, and then environmental toxicant exposures. <coughs> um, these are just some research studies on nutrient deficiencies. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids are oftentimes really important, very helpful, um, so that's fish oil, things like that. Um, and then uh, malabsorption, this one study talks about malabsorption of B12, uh, B12 is a very important nutrient. All of the B vitamins are very important to help the neurological system to function normally. I find that's very helpful. Um, I see you know, mostly uh, autism and ADHD, but I also see other patients. I have patients with other neurological issues, tremors, Parkinson's, um, uh, multiple sclerosis, and B vitamins are very important for all neurological diseases. Um, and autism is no exception, so B vitamins are, are very important. Um, one note, I mean, oftentimes we'll do, there's a lot of studies on B12 and B6, so we'll supplement those, um, but I like when they're taking B6 or B12 to also have them on some type of B complex or a really good multivitamin. Um, um, you know, one of the multivitamins I like um, is by Claire, by a company called Claire, and it's um, Vita Spectrum. So that's a multivitamin that I like. Um, they can also do a B-complex because if you're doing 
um, just one or two of the B vitamins, like B6 or B12, you can potentially deplete some of your other B vitamins. So that's why I like when you're when a child or an adult is taking B6 or B12, but they're also taking a B complex so that they don't, or a, a good multivitamin that has, um, you know, that has other B vitamins in it, so that they don't deplete their other B vitamins. Um, oh, I'll, I I guess just something else. Too. I mean, I don't have any financial connections with any of the other companies, so I don't have any, you know financial connections with like Claire or anything like that. Um, and um, so, and then, you know, the study also talks about B6 um, and magnesium, so those are really important. Um, and so, you know, so I talked about supplementing nutri um, nutrient deficiencies, so omega-3 fatty acids, B6, B12, magnesium, there are a lot of other things that potentially could be deficient, especially if they have a lot of gastrointestinal inflammation in their gut, right? So if they have, you know, if you have a lot of inflammation in your intestines, then you're not gonna be able to absorb the nutrients. You need, especially if you have inflammation in the small intestine, because that's the primary area where we really absorb most of our nutrients is in the small intestine. Um, eliminating food allergies again. Um, if there are things like folate receptor antibodies, um, like I mentioned, you can what you can do is treat folinic, treat with folinic acid or leucoborin. Uh, what that does effectively is folinic acid is the active form of folate. Um, and so it's specifically folinic acid, not folic acid. You know, folic acid is always what they talk about with making sure you're taking folic acid in pregnancy. But folinic acid um, is the active form of folate, and what that does is it bypasses the receptor so that you can get that directly into the brain. Um, so, and then decreasing inflammation, um, avoiding exposure to environmental toxins. Um, and another common issue is stimming. You know, people always ask, well, why do they stim? Um, so, you know, there are some potential things, you know, gastrointestinal inflammation, a lot of the same things, food allergies, sensitivities. So you can see that when we address a lot of these things, we're treating not just the symptom, we're not just looking at, okay, how can we decrease stimming? How can we help their language? But when we treat these things, then it can help with a lot of different things, with stimming, with language, with a lot of, um, a lot of those things. Um, there can be an over activity of the, the fight or flight, food allergies or sensitivities. Um, you know, so potential medical treatments, decreasing inflammation, uh, magnesium if you have that overactive fight or flight response, uh, eliminating food allergies, so you know, gluten casein free diet, I also usually add soy free, as I mentioned. Um, so I'm just gonna go through some simple cases. Um, the first two cases are anything, you know, really miraculous. Um, tendency towards loose stool. So when we did some lab tests, um, we found that he had iron and vitamin D deficiency and intestinal yeast overgrowth. Um, <coughs> some of the things that I recommended, um, melatonin, probiotics, fish oil, iron and vitamin D for the deficiencies, um, specially formulated multivitamin and mineral. Um, that was uh, the Claire Clairbiotic, or sorry, uh, Clairvita Spectrum. Um, uh, we did some botanical antifungals. You can also do pharmaceutical antifungals. I usually try, if possible, to do a less invasive approach, like using herbs, things like that. Um, again, those aren't as well, you know, herbal remedies aren't as well substantiated in the literature, but there are certain products and certain things that I find to be clinically very effective. Um, so, uh, and then by HTP. Um, so change over a three month period, um, you know, I have most patients rate the symptoms on a scale of zero to 12, 12 being the worst, incapacitating, and zero being no problems at all. Um, eye contact went from a nine to an eight. So like I mentioned, most of these are usually slow, gradual improvement. Um, you know, after starting the, but you know, but the parents are saying after he started the antifungal, and he did definitely make more eye contact. It was slightly better. It wasn't huge, but there was noticeable improvement. Um, language did improve. They rated from 10 down to an 8. Um, <clears throat> and then social interaction from an 11 to a 10. And this kind of goes along with both language and social interaction. They said he still requires prompting, but now he actually says hi and bye. You know, even before when we tried to prompt him, like he wouldn't say hi and bye to people. Now. Says, you know, it's fun, you know, he says hi and bye um, to people. Um, <clears throat> his attention and focus did seem to improve, went from a nine to a seven. 
um, sleep went from a nine to a seven. So melatonin, they said melatonin really works. He goes to sleep in 15 minutes. Um, and then he, this is a child that had uh, kind of recurring infections, so we're addressing that. Um, you know, with that piece, but they said when he's not sick, he typically sleeps, you know, he sleeps well through the night. Um, motor skills went from <coughs> nine to eight. They said improved, you know, he's more active and climbing. He used to bump into walls um, because he wasn't paying attention, uh, which he doesn't do anymore, um, but he's, you know, he's still clumsy. Um, this is another child, four-year-old male, diagnosed with autism, um, foul smelling, very loose stool, uh, one to two times a day. Um, occasionally see undigested food in the stool, um, the mother had already started to reduce dairy intake and she had already added probiotics before coming to see me. Um, so she found that, that the stool was better with those um, interventions. Um, but then one to two times a month, he would have constipation, like he wouldn't have a bowel movement for two days. And then when it did come, it was like really hard, it was like pebbles. Um, and then he, he really had to strain, it was painful and he would get really grouchy. Um, he was a really picky eater, toilet training was difficult, eye contact. Um, not more than a few seconds. His stims, he would tend to look at things sideways. Um, and he would also bite the mouth objects a lot. Um, he used to bite people but that, that improved with ABA um, and occupational therapy. Um, he produces two to three word sentences. Um, um, but he's very rigid. So like if, if his mom um, took him, you know, out of the car, you know, on the right side instead of the left, he would have total meltdown, total tantrum. Um, so, you know, when we did lab tests, we found that he had intestinal inflammation, multiple food sensitivities, including, including gluten and casein, um, iron and vitamin D deficiency, um, and intestinal yeast overgrowth. So, um, recommended gluten-free, gluten free, casein-free diet, uh, digestive enzymes, uh, glutamine, probiotics, um, uh, botanical antifungal, iron, vitamin D, specially formulated multivitamin and mineral fish oil, um, and then something called dimethylglycine. It's called DMG, and it's a, it's a type of B vitamin. Um, but this is often very helpful with speech or with the uh, obsessive compulsive types of behaviors, things like that. Um, and, um, so change over a six month period. Um, stools are the biggest thing that improved. Um, so they started the gluten-free casein free diet um, two months before and um, after do, you know, making that change. Um, at this point, he wasn't 100% on the diet. Um, she said the mom said maybe 95%. Um, but it really helped with the stools, just even with reducing it. Um, the stools are much more formed, not as foul smelling. The potty training got a lot easier. Because um, she said before when you have diarrhea, I mean, like, he couldn't even control it. Like, he would, you know, it would just come and he couldn't even you know, wait until they got to the potty. Um, so that really helped with the potty training. So when he eats casein, which is the protein that's in dairy, um, he has foul smelling loose stools, gas and bloating um, decreased. The gas wasn't as foul smelling as before. Um, he was still a picky eater, um, but she said now he has the skills to learn new foods and he was starting to eat new, food, you know, different types of foods. Um, stimming reduced uh, a little bit from nine down to an eight. He still had a lot of rigidity, um, but he, but it had improved. He wasn't throwing a tantrum um, anymore when his mom, when his mom could take him out of the car from the other side, he wouldn't have his huge meltdown. You know, which I mean, it's a small thing. You know, he still is seven, still has issues. But you know, and when you're a parent and your child has a huge tantrum, you know, just because you know you're taking them out of the other side of the car, that can be a big deal. Um, and she was really happy about that. Um, she said, he understands, um, you know, what I'm saying better than before, and now I can negotiate with him, you know, and he doesn't have a meltdown when I take him out of the car from the other side. Um, so eye contact, social interaction, sensory issues, those are pretty much the same at this point. Um, but you know, the mom hadn't talked about sleep as one of the main concerns, but she did note, you know, on six months after follow-up, she said that sleep had definitely improved. Um, he sleeps throughout the night, he sleeps more soundly. Um, when before he was in a regular sleeper. And that was um, specifically, I didn't put it in here, because um, it's, um, but this is something, it's uh, something called Qigong massage. It's a Chinese medicine-based massage. Um, that, um, this, it's, a, it's another therapy that I'm also trained in. Um, there, there actually is uh, literature on it. It's not necessarily a medical treatment, 
Um, but it's it's kind of more in the realm of like an occupational type of a thing. I learned it um, when I was in Oregon, and, and most of the other people who were trained were occupational therapists in it. Um, but it's it's a um, it's a massage that parents can learn to do at home. Um, so I like it because it's very cost effective. Um, and so that was one thing that the mom started. She noticed when she started doing the Qigong massage on him every night, she noticed a pretty significant improvement in his sleep. Um, and she said that she also found changes in, she said that it, it helped him improve with sensory issues. Um, so there's um, information on that. Um, if you, it's, uh, the website is www.qsti. Org. Um, and uh, that's something that there's a there's a book and a DVD specifically written for parents that you can look at. Um, and there's the one of the doctors who pioneered that actually has published. She published. Uh, it was a control. Um, it was a placebo control. It was a, it was a control randomized trial using the Qigong massage and found that it helped. With a lot of sensory issues, sleep. Um, I just like it because it's something parents can do at home, and so it's very cost effective. And, um, so, so if you know, if you get, also if you have questions on that, you, know, you can contact me separately. But it's something that I, I you know, I'll bring the parents to the office, train them on it, you know, and then we can do it on their children at home. Um, this is another case, um, nine-year-old male. Um, so. This is one of those few cases where you actually see a child uh, recover from autism. This isn't um, a norm, but this can happen, and I've seen it. Um, so when he was two years old, um, so he was previously diagnosed with autism and verbal apraxia. Uh, when he was two years old, he had a 10-word vocabulary. Autistic behavior started. When he was three years old, um, he was diagnosed as PDD-NOS. Um, started early intervention, speech, and OT, or occupational therapy. Um, after about 10 months in his bed preschool, he had about a 40-word vocabulary. Um, was still a poor sleeper, limited food choices, tantrums, inattentive. Um, you know, started medical treatments. Um, we found that he had food allergies, yeast infections, viral infections, impaired liver detoxification pathways, among a lot of things. This isn't everything. There are a lot of other things. Um, so they started the gluten-free casein, free diet, digestive enzymes, cod liver oil, um, specially formulated multivitamin, mineral probiotics, um, B12, glutathione, minerals, antifungals, antivirals, DMG, which is the dimethylglycine, the type of B vitamin. Um, and they did a, a lot, a lot of other treatments in three years. Um, and then this was um, B12, um, and this is actually B12 injections um, for some children, especially if they have a lot of gastrointestinal inflammation, we find that B12 injections um, tend to be more effective than oral B12. Um, a lot of parents are really scared by the idea of a needle, um, but it's, it's like an insulin syringe, it's a very tiny needle um, that can be more effective um, in some cases than an oral B12. Um, and so they saw gradual improvement over the years um, sorry, with multiple medical treatments. Um, and then he was at a special ABA school. Um, and he just, I mean, improved, improved, and he's currently lost um, his autism diagnosis. And he currently just has dyslexia. Um, so this is definitely, it's usually more the exception than the rule, but I do see it happen. It's usually when we have families that start early early intervention. Um, I mean, I wish, you know, and there's a lot of things, you know, I wish, I, I say, oh, I wish I knew when my brother was young, you know, because now he's an adult, so. Um, but I think, we, I think as parents a lot of times, especially parents and caregivers, um, we carry so much guilt. I wish I had known, especially if you have an older child, I wish I had known this, you know, when my child was younger. And I mean, I say the same thing, but I think looking back, I've just kind of come to it where, you know, you just realize that you did the best that you can, that you could at the time that, you know, with whatever you knew. And um, there was a, you know, a good friend of mine, um, Betsy Hicks, that um, 
she did a presentation once, and her husband is uh, a doctor that does a lot of these treatments too. And, and she gave a presentation when she, she was talking to parents. She said, the guilt stops here. You know, because she talked about how much guilt she carried, you know, as a parent, and wishing, oh, I wish I had known this when I was, you know, when he was younger, or, you know, but she's like, but, you know, we can't, we can't go back and change the past, but we can just move forward with what we have. Um, and so, you know, I really just try to encourage parents, you know, don't beat yourself up, don't, you know, let go of the guilt. There's so, we carry so much of that already. You know, just without, you know, just parents as normal kids, you know, we have so much guilt and, you know, I could do this better. But, you know, it's really just, um, because, you know, it's about caring for yourself as well. Um, and the Hawaii Autism Foundation actually started a program with, with the YMCA about, you know, just helping to support caregivers and parents because, you know, you have to take care of yourself too, right? So it's about being, loving compassion to yourself too. And when, you know, when we take care of ourselves, that's one of the best ways that we can take care of our kids too. Because if we're just stressed out and not, you know, you know, they always it's the idea, right? You know, put on your own oxygen mask before you help your kids, you know. So um, so I just really want to speak to that too, because I've been there and I've been through a lot of that, you know, with my brother. There's so many things I wish I could have done when he was younger, you know, but um, I just moved forward from this point and, you know, just really trying to help him move forward with as much as he can do, you know, at this point. So, um, and a lot of times with older children, you know, we don't see as dramatic changes as we do, you know, with younger children, um, but we do see some changes. You know, I've seen small changes, you know, small improvements with my brother, and I just, I celebrate those things, you know. Um, and then I think a lot of times we have gifts as, you know, as parents and caregivers of children with special needs, right? You know, even the small things we can just celebrate. I mean, I remember that my brother used to be deathly afraid of the telephone. He would never, ever talk on the telephone. He had all of these speech issues, and nobody could understand him. He, he didn't start verbalizing until he was three start battle until he was three and so he was delayed and he eventually did speak um, but you know he just was really he was he was very self-conscious about the phone and then I remember I came home one time and he was like talking on the phone and I was like, oh my gosh you know so I think it's really about celebrating those small things right I mean you know, most of their parents would be like, you know, if they have a teenager that's talking on the phone, it would be like, oh my gosh, my kid is talking on the phone, you know? But, I mean, for me, that was a really big deal, you know? Um, so it's about celebrating those things. Um, and so these are just some resources. Um, Easter Seals Hawaii, you know, we really want to thank them. They offer a lot of early intervention services. So if you do have a child um, that is, uh, you know, three years old or under, um, or under three years old, you know, seek them out because they have a lot of resources for you. Um, talk about caring autism. Um, so this is a good website. They offer lots of resources. They also have a listserv that you can join. Um, there's a national PAPA listserv and there's a Hawaii-based one. And so if you go to their website and you scroll down to the bottom of the page, they have information on the listservs. Um, and you can access, they have, um, you know, as I mentioned, they have the support groups. Um, you know, I'll just mention this again. They, we have a leeward group, um, and the next one is going to be uh, Saturday, August 13th at 3 to 5 p.m. Check the website um, at the One Long Starbucks in Cal City. Um, but that's a really great place to be able to connect with other parents, to be able to just, you know, get, feel supported uh, for you as, as a parent. Um, and um, Autism Society of Hawaii, um, they offer free social skills groups to their members um, for different age ranges, um, and membership I think is like $25 a year, and have, you know, free social skills groups, so those can be helpful. Um, and then I'm also helping to actually run a, um, a sibling support group um, for there so you can get information, or you, you know, if you have, so it's, it's basically a support group for children, I think we have it, um, you know, we don't have uh, teenagers right now, but if you have teenagers, we, we might, if we have enough demand, we'll start one. But it's for children, I think, 10 years and under, 
right now, but if you have siblings, you know, of your children that want to feel supported, that's something else that um, we're offering the Autism Society of Hawaii that I'm helping with. Um, so just so that, you know, to be able to kind of help support the siblings, because a lot of times the siblings can feel neglected or things like that. Um, so that's another good resource. Medical Academy of Pediatric Special Needs um, is one specifically with training with physicians um, to be able to learn about the medical treatments for autism based on all this current research. Um, so you know, it would be great if we could encourage more physicians in Hawaii to, to get the training, um, just to be more aware you know, of all of, all of this research that's coming out. Um, and the Hawaii Autism Foundation provides a lot of resources. Um, they also provide scholarships to help cover the costs of medical treatments. Um, and I believe, is the application still open? We're still accepting applications yeah. for this year. Yeah. So um, the deadline from previously was in February, but they still have um, uh, scholarship money. So if you have you know, questions or things, you can probably talk to Ken. You can go onto um, their website. Um, you know, you can also email me and I can send you the link. You can just Google it. I mean, it's like Hawaii <coughs> Autism Foundation, Taka Scholarship or something. You can probably send the link. Um, yeah, so 